Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her angers me. Sayyida Fatima al Zahra, Salamullahi alayha, has a great and tragic story. Throughout the year, we commemorate the calamities that befell her eminence through different narrations and we honor her legacy. <laughs> Therefore, her majalis must be established in Karbala. Imam Hussein TV complex has a Husseiniya being built on the ground floor to hold majalis throughout the year to allow pilgrims to pray, rest and eat tabarruk, but it still needs a lot of work. We are asking for £250 and upwards to help with flooring, wiring, furnishing and decorating. Each donation of £250 will receive a bundle of Karbala relics, which include a turba of Karbala, prayer beads made from the holy land of Karbala, khaki shifa from the grave of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, and lastly, a water of alqama from beside the grave of Abu Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. Or, if you donate £786, you will not only receive our Karbala bundle, but you will also receive an official flag from the shrine of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. These flags have had the barakah of being kept inside the blessed dome of the shrine of Sayyid al-Shahida for three nights. To find out more, visit imamhussein3.tv forward slash HQ or call us on the numbers displayed below. Let us not let the legacy of Sayyid Fatima al-Zahra perish. Her story must be told. Whilst this winter many of you will be enjoying the festive season, Afghanistan is going through a crisis. Every winter the weather will reach temperatures as low as minus 18 degrees Celsius. With little finances and homes not adequate enough to keep the heat in, many families struggle during this season. The elderly are vulnerable and physically challenged to fight the cold during these days and nights. Young children must walk through snow and ice in order to get to school and return to a chilly and bitter cold home. Imam Hussein Development and Relief Foundation are determined to help. We will be providing households with coal to burn throughout the winter. $150 is all we need. $150 will be enough to provide heat and warmth for one household for the whole of winter. That's $150 for four months. You can donate via PayPal, bank transfer, or visit us at www.ihdrf.org to make a donation. Our Imams tell us the best of you are those who help those who are desperate. Help us spread the warmth. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina wa Azimina Wa Habib Qulubina wa Shafi'i Nufusina Abil Qasim Muhammad Allahumma salam وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله 
أما بعد إن ابنتي فاطمة بضعة مني من أحبها فقد أحبني ومن آذاها فقد آذاني The death of Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam is without a doubt one of the saddest as well as one of the most contentious issues in the history of the religion of Islam. One of the saddest and one of the most contentious incidents in the history of the religion. All Muslims agree that Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam departed from this world at the tender young age, either in her teens or at the very maximum in her 20s. But there is an unbelievable polarization as to how she died. One school who believe that Fatima al-Zahra died a natural death, that she left this world, yes, at a very young age, but she died a natural death. There was nothing which is suspicious to be found around the causes of her death. Then you find within other schools, such as the 12th school especially, the belief that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam died oppressed, died as a martyr. And many times you find that these words are associated with her. Fatima is known as a shahida, as a female martyr. She is known as a madluma, as the oppressed one, as a muttahida, one who has been in a way attacked, as a maqhura, one who has been hurt. Therefore, the question arises as to why there are such divergent opinions. As in, why is it that you've got one group of the Muslim world who come to a conclusion that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam died naturally, and another school who believe that she was killed? And indeed, you don't find this for many other personalities. All the Muslims agree that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam was, for example, assassinated. All the Muslims agree that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was, for example, killed on the plains of Karbala. But when it comes to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, if you go to non-Shia, they'll clearly say to you that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, there's nothing suspicious by the way she died. The lady had grieved her father, and because of that grief, she had passed away. And then you have the Shia when it comes to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, who in this time of year, many congregate because of their belief. They believe that she has been killed. And that the Shia add to this, embellish this by saying that she has been killed and her rib has been broken. And then some go further in saying that she was slapped and that she miscarried her baby, the baby by the name of Al-Muhsin or Al-Muhassin and so on and so forth. Without a doubt, this issue, therefore, the issue that we'll title for the next three nights, the incident of the door, this without a doubt is an issue that requires a thorough dissection. A dissection for a number of reasons. First and foremost, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, all Muslims agree, occupies the most important of positions amongst the females in the history of the religion of Islam. Whether you're Shia or not Shia, you'll reach a conclusion that when you study some of the exegesis of the Qur'an, some of the tafasir of the Qur'an, or you study some of the narrations within the corpus of traditions in Islamic history, you'll reach a conclusion that Fatima al-Zahra has a very high position. You could see, for example, that certain verses of the Qur'an are revealed in her honor, possibly more than any of her contemporaries. Aisha, for example, was a contemporary of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, but you could not say that there are many verses which are revealed necessarily about her. One may show, for example, the incident of the ifk and the circumstances considering or discussing the issue of slander for an adulteress. And then you may find, for example, the incident of Maghafir in Surah Tahrim. Whereas with Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, the verses that may be revealed about her highlight her position. The verse of Mubahala, for example. She is seen that of all the ladies present in Medina at the time, when the ayah was revealed in Surah 3 verse 59, that the Qur'an had said that when the Christians are in discussions with you, come to the Mubahala, but what should you do? فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ Bring your woman and we'll bring ours. Who does Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi take as his woman? He takes Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And this is something that can be seen not just in Shia literature, but also in non-Shia literature as well. You look at the incident of the Kisa, 
those under the cloak, not just in Shia literature, but in non-Shia literature, that Fatima al-Zahra was under the Yemeni cloak with her father and with her husband and with her two sons. And the verse is revealed in Nama. You read Allah al so you have these ayahs of the Quran, let alone other ayahs. Wa yutaimun al-ta'am ala hubbihi miskina wa yatiman wa asira wa qul la as'alukum alayhi ajran illa al-mawaddata fil qurba and so on and so forth. So, Fatima al-Zahra occupies a prominent position from the Quran, from the world of hadith as well. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is the one that we see that of the women who are seen as the ladies of Kamal, she is one of them. When you normally hear the name of Asiya bint Muzahim, and Maria, the daughter of Imran, and Khadija, the daughter of Khuwailid, and Fatima al Zahra, alayhi salam. So you see in the world of hadith that the Prophet takes it even a step further. When the Prophet says, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her, angers me. All Muslims agree on this. Therefore, when we discuss the death of Fatima al Zahra, alayhi salam, we're not discussing any random personality. Rather, we're discussing a personality who the Quran and the world of tradition has looked at with the highest reverence. However, when we come to her death, you find that when you're looking at the literature or at the incident of her death, if I speak about myself on a personal level, if you ask me in my teens, do I believe that Fatima al-Zahra was a shahida at the age of 15 or 16 or 17 or 18, I'll reply back to you by saying that yes, I believe that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam died as a martyr. If you ask me what happened to her, I as a Shi'i will say to you that what happened to her was that she was behind the door and a door was smashed on her. And then I would add to that by saying that I heard as well that she miscarried her baby and that because of those injuries, she died within some say 45 days, some say 75. Some go on to more than 90. Some go even up to a few months after that. That was my understanding as I was growing up as a teen. Because my understanding and the understanding of a non-Shi'i is based majority on what our parents teach us. If my parents teach me that Fatima al-Zahra died in this way, then I'm going to follow what my parents say. If a non-Shi'i, like our Sunni brothers and sisters out there, their understanding of how Fatima al-Zahra died depends on how their parents taught them. Because the reality is, if you were to ask me at that time, in which sources have you read this incident about the death of Fatima al-Zahra I'll reply by saying, to tell you the honest truth, I listen to people on the Manabar, and that Mawlana looks like he studied, he looks much older than me, and he looks like somebody who my parents revere. So when he's come to this conclusion, I follow him. I really have nowhere else to go in understanding this piece of literature. I want to find a book. I don't know which book it's written in. At that time, probably I wasn't even reading books. The reality is that the most important aspect when we enter the discussion of the incident of the door is to ask ourselves sincerely and to be intellectually honest as well with ourselves as Shia or as Sunnis have we actually ourselves gone to the literature and looked at what the literature says about the incident of the door? Or is it that we've only relied on people who sit on the pulpit or we rely on what our parents say? I can even go further and say that we couldn't even rely on what our maraja say on this issue. Because the reality is our maraja, most of their discussions are fiqh orientated or usul al-fiqh orientated. So therefore, if I look at, for example, Ayatollah al-Khoi, or I look at Ayatollah al-Hakim, or I look at Ayatollah, for example, al-Sistani, will I find a book from them discussing the incident of the door? No, I won't. There is no book from Ayatollah al-Khoi that is called The Incident of the Door, or at least is given a title like Al-Hujjat al-Gharra ala Shahadat al-Zahra, for example. I will not find a book like that. There is no book called al Hujjat al-Gharra ala Shahad al-Zahra, like I may see of someone like Sheikh Subhani, I don't see that within Ayatollah al-Khui's biographies or the books that he's written. If I look at Ayatollah al-Sistani, of the limited works that we have which are published, of the many that Ayatollah al-Sistani may have written on, there isn't anything on the incident of the door. Ayatollah al-Hakim, 
many works, usul al-fiqh, fiqh, but I don't see much on that. Ayatullah Muhammad Baqir al-Sahid. May God bless all of their souls and the souls of our scholars. You find he would have written about Fadak, for example. And therefore, there is an aim there from him to go towards the direction of discussing what we will continue to discuss tomorrow night and the incidents that led up to the door. Tonight, I want to ask a central question to our conscience that we as Shia, where have we ever read the whole incident of the door? Where? If someone was to come and ask you today, you as a Shi'i, you believe that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam died as a Shahida? You say, yes, I do. And you believe that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, there was an incident of a door and the door was smashed on her and there was a nail and a broken rib? You say, yes, I do. You believe that she was slapped. Have you ever cried when someone says she was slapped? Yes, I do. There are now ma'atim in the Shi'i world. Right now, in the Shi'i world, there are many ma'atim that are discussing the death of Fatima al-Zahra, the martyrdom of Fatima al-Zahra. I believe 95% of the people in these ma'atim, if you were to ask them one simple question, what is the source for your honoring this occasion? They will not be able to answer you. I believe. They won't be able to answer. They will be there to listen to a lecture. They'll be there to cook food. They'll be there to stand up and beat their chest. Okay, you can tick the boxes on all of these, but there's a central question you have to ask yourself and when you look in the mirror, that when I believe in this issue, have I looked at the sources on this issue? Do I even know the names of some of these sources? For all I know, I may be following something which I am being academically dishonest with myself. Of course, the same can apply to the non-Shi'i. The non-Shi'i who says that I don't believe that Fatima al-Zahra died as a martyr and that she was not oppressed. What is this muttahida and maqhura and madluma and shahida? I don't believe any of these things. They're all in your Shi'i made up mythical forgeries. Rather, I believe that I have to respect Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. She's the daughter of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And that's as far as it goes. I ask that non-Shi'i, if you're being truthful to yourself, have you read the sources that discuss this issue? Because this issue, what's clear, is that we have a collective Muslim memory about this issue. What do I mean? When I say the incident of the door, what do I mean by incident of the door? What I mean is what led up to the incident of the door? What happened between somebody in a house and somebody in communication with those in the house? Whether threats took place, whether a door was there, whether a door was pushed, whether someone died as a result of that push. One thing is for certain which we'll see tonight and that is that the Muslims collectively knew that there was a controversy surrounding this whole house of Fatima. They knew there's a controversy. Whether you're Shi'i or not Shi'i, that even non-Shi'as who are listening to this lecture, whether you like what I conclude with or I don't in the next few nights, whereas tonight we just want to focus on the sources primarily, you cannot deny that many ulama from the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century of Islam until today have grappled with the issue of Abu Bakr, Umar, Khalid and the likes with Ali, Fatima, az zubair and the likes. I'm putting all of them together because you're going to see when we look at the source literature, there's clearly an issue. But what are these sources that we're employing? Are we being academically honest with ourselves as Shia? That when I now bring up my children and I'm like, this is exactly what happened. Can I ex really know exactly what happened? Can I really reconstruct exactly what happened? At the end of the day, history is his story. History is his story. You break the word into two. The reality is that even the Muslim historians who will mention tonight, even them, you'll find that they're bound to add their own masala, whether I like to say this or I don't, to the book that they're writing. Because all of us come with certain theological lenses. My theological lens has dictated to me a certain conclusion about certain personalities. Therefore, the only way I'm going to look at history is what suits my narrative. 
And that applies to Sunni and Shia. If I revere certain personalities, I will never like narrations that go against them. Mind you, a caveat has to be put before we go into the discussion, which is what? Which is even some Shia today don't believe in what happened to Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. It's not just non-Shia. There are some Shia in our own households who will say to you that, you know what, this is exaggeration. I don't believe this. Now, when they say this, some of them come from a sincere angle that, look, I want my questions answered on this issue. I may be a medic, I may be a lawyer, I may be in finance, I may be in whatever. It's not my speciality. It's up to you to talk about these things. And many of them are not going to read, for example, Al-Hujjat Al-Gharra or, for example, Al-Hujum Ala Bayt Al-Zahra by the likes of Abd Al-Zahra Mahdi. Many are not going to pick up these books and read them. Many are going to expect the ones on the Mambar to be the ones who explain this. The ones on the Mambar themselves, in many cases, only will regurgitate what's in a book. If you ask the person, have you looked at the authenticity of what you're saying? Have you dissected it? Have you understood the social milieu or sectarian milieu in which you emerged? No. For them, some majority of those who sit on the Mambar, majority, you will find, are not people who would have looked at the crystallization of Shiism and how it's developed or how it's evolved. For them, it's black and white. That look, this is exactly what happened and no one can question it. A second caveat to the discussion which is important, again, before we go in, because I think all of these things need to be mentioned, is Alhamdulillah, we live in a time where we're not worried about discussing this issue. And the likes of maybe Sheikh Al-Mufid and others, when we come to them, Sheikh Al-Mufid and others maybe don't want to even go further on this issue because a Hanbali Shi'i fight will emerge all of a sudden in that particular part of the world. And even you see many of our Mawlanas for years could not discuss this issue openly because of the issues that could emerge and the sectarian problems that could come out. Alhamdulillah, we now live in a period where we're able to discuss what happened in early Islam without the fear of someone randomly in a Jordanian mosque or someone randomly in a mosque in Egypt suddenly coming and killing us. Rather, alhamdulillah, I'm able to open up this discussion and look at the key issues. Therefore, tonight, before we look at what exactly took place, we need to ask ourselves the question, which sources do we look at? And I'd like to do this in the following stages. Number one, in the schools of the religion of Islam, have they all looked at the issue of Fatima al-Zahra and the incident of the door? And what are all the different schools in the religion of Islam? Number two, what are the sources that I as a Shi'i have to use to look at the incident of the door? And are these sources that I use all reliable? Are they all agreed upon? Do they all agree with one another? Number three, if I'm not a Shi'i and I belong, for example, to the Sunni school, which sources do I look at to see what happened with the incident of the door? Who are the main thinkers and historians and jurists and philosophers and theologians who in non-Shi'i texts may have mentioned the incident of the door or what took place at that particular time? Number four, is there a difference between looking at an issue of history and an issue of law when it comes to the veracity of an proof of an incident. Are jurisprudential works and historical works the same? Or do we look at jurisprudence in one way? And do we look at history in another? And is this something which is agreed upon by all schools? Number five, therefore this incident of the door, is it part of the collective memory of the Muslims, irrespective of their milal, their nihal, and their different opinions? And number six, what's an example of a hadith that is clearly in non-Shi'i literature about the first Khalifa's regrets when he is dying. And how does such a hadith highlight to us that the Shi'i conception of an invasion on the door of Fatima is not something far-fetched, but can even be seen in the works of renowned scholars. Let's examine this and dissect in this part one the topic in complete depth. When we come to the schools of the religion of Islam, if you ask many Muslims in the world today, which schools talk about incidents, for example, in history? They'll normally divide into two, Sunni and Shia. The reality is that even within Sunni and even within Shia, there are many subgroups. And each of these subgroups, in one way or the other, 
has commented about what took place with Fatima al Zahra alayha salam when she died. What do I mean? The Shia, have they commented on the inside of the door? Yes. The non-Shia, have they commented on the inside of the door? Yes. Who, when we say the non-Shia, we talk of the Sunni. Which groups of the Sunni? The Sunni, when you meet someone and they say to you, I'm Sunni, within the Sunni world, there are schools of jurisprudence and there are schools of theology. Jur of uh, jurisprudence, for example, you may meet someone who's Sunni, he says to you, I'm Hanafi. That means he belongs to the Hanafi school of fiqh. Therefore, you may find Hanafi scholars. Someone Maliki belongs to the Maliki school. Someone Shafi'i belongs to the Shafi'i school. Someone Hanbali belongs to the Hanbali school. These four schools, of course, are not the only four schools that emerged. There were hundreds of schools that emerged. But these, let's say, that were patronized by, for example, the state. In the Sunni world, therefore, if I meet someone Sunni, they may turn around to me and say, I'm Hanafi, which means that they follow that particular school of fiqh. What happens if they turn around to me and say, I'm Mu'tazili? A Mu'tazili is not someone who follows a school of fiqh named after someone called Abu Mu'tazil or named after Muhammad bin Idris al-Mu'tazili or Ahmed ibn Hanbal al-Mu'tazili. No, the Mu'tazila are a group of people who may be seen in that early generation as having theological opinions that differed with others in that community. So you may have someone who later, with the terminology that crystallizes later of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, someone might be Mu'tazili, but Sunni. Someone might be Ash'ari and Sunni. Someone might be Maturidi and Sunni. Someone might be Tahawi and Sunni. Because these are all different thinkers within the schools. In the Mu'tazili school, am I going to find sources or certain scholars who would have discussed the incident of the door? Yes. I may find, for example, someone like Ibrahim and Nadhan. Ibrahim and Nadhan was one of the teachers of Jahid, the renowned bell letterist and academic. And Nadhan worked for Al Ma'moon. And Nadhan was one of the highest scholars of the Mu'tazila. And Nadhan is not Shi'i. Ibrahim and Nadhan is not Shi'i. But has he discussed the incident of the door? Yes, he has. Does he have an opinion on the incident of the door? Yes, he does. He is not Shi'i. Someone might say, but you Shi'i have made up everything about this incident. No, but I've got someone here who's Mu'tazili. But I can also have another Mu'tazili, like Ibn Abil Hadid. Ibn Abil Hadid, Al-Mu'tazili, who has written the famous work, the Sharh of Nahj al-Balagha. Many times, when you see references of Nahj al-Balagha, you always see Sharh al-Nahj. Sharh al-Nahj could refer to a number of scholars, but one of them, is Ibn Abi al-Hadid. He's known as Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazili. Has he ever talked about the incident of the door? Yes. Which school does he belong to? He's Mu'tazili Sunni. He has discussed what? The incident of the door. Then I may find, for example, amongst the Mu'tazila, amongst the Ash'ara, amongst others, I may find, for example, Ibn Hajar. I may find, for example, Ibn Taymiyyah. I may find others. All of these have discussed the incident of the door. Within Shia, are we the only Shia in the world? No. In the Shia world, can you name other Shia groups? Yes. Is Zaydiya, majority in Yemen, you find is Zaydiya, are Shia. They have some great ulama amongst the Zaydis. Have they discussed the incident of the door? Yes. The Zaydis used to have an opinion about the incident of the door. The Ismailiya, currently led by the Agha Khan, Many years they led or they ruled the Islamic world with the Fatimid dynasty. And they had renowned scholars such as Qadhi Nu'man. Has Qadhi Nu'man of the Ismailiyah discussed the incident of the door and the war of words between Fatima Zahra and the ruling parties? Yes, he has. In the Ithna Ashariya, have there been ulama? From the beginning until today who have discussed? Yes. Therefore, all the schools in Islam, Shia and non-Shia, at one stage or another, came together and discussed the incident of the door. It wasn't just us, the Shia. From the very earliest days of this religion, you found that people who were renowned scholars gave their take on how much of the incident of the door they believed in. Because remember, we said the incident of the door has certain stages. Prophet's death, Saqifa, Fadak, war of words, push on door, miscarriage, 
if you bring everyone together, in one way or the other, they've discussed each of these. Someone says, where, Sayyidna? Now my non-Shia friend says to me, bro, you believe in the incident of the door? You believe Fatima and Zahra, this is what happened to her? Yes. Where? In your books. Don't say in Sunni books. In your books, where is it written? Someone wants to ask you, what would you say? Say, so, oh, you know, there's a speaker. I heard him. He, he, he discussed it. Really? Yani, as a Shi'i who follows the man who's meant to be the gate to the city of knowledge, I reach a situation in the year 2021 with internet and with books online that I do not even know where the narration of the incident of the door is written. Really? Do you know how many Shia households in the world? And try this at home, by the way. Either ask yourself or ask the person sitting next to you the incident of the door and the martyrdom of Fatima Zahra which is seen as a major belief in Shia circles. Where is it written? Now, when we look at it, we're going to mention some of the sources today where this is discussed. Tomorrow, we'll look at bringing the narrative together. But today, some of the sources. The first source that the Shia will come to where they say, I get my narrative on the inside of the door is Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali. That's the first place. Of course, you have some of the Shia who've never heard. What's Kitab Sulaim? What is this? I've never heard of this in my life. When, when one may argue that the most controversial book in not just Shia history, but possibly the most controversial book to discuss early history is Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali. When you look at Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali, it's a book that details exactly, in his opinion, whether it's Sulaim's book, we don't know. Whether it's Aban's book, we don't know. Whether it's Umar bin Hulayna's book, I don't know. Reality is that as a Shi'i, I rely on Kitab Sulaim and I see that this book, which you'll find some Shi'a have at home because it's in English as well, and that some Shi'a have never heard of, when you come to open this book, this book details for you what takes place, one may argue, let's say in the first hundred odd years and after of the religion of Islam. Okay? The problem I find when I'm looking at this book, I've got an issue. Because I find that if I look at a scholar like Nu'mani, he's telling me Kitab Sulaim bin Qais, tick, go all the way with it. But then I look at a scholar like Bahbudi, and he says to me, this is a forgery. Got two ulama of the Shia. One of them is saying Kitab Sulaim is a book to be taken. Another is saying is a forgery. I look at Ayatollah al khoi He says, well, the path to this book highlights that there's weakness there. I've now got a problem. I've got Ayatollah al khoi telling me that this book which I'm relying on supposedly as a Shi'i the only book I can rely on on the incident of the door is Kitab Sulaim. Now I've got Ayatollah al-Khoi saying to me weak. Bahbudi saying forgery. And I've got Nu'mani saying to me take it all the way. I've got Sheikh al-Mufid saying refer to the scholars about what's written in Kitab Sulaim. Don't take it all because there are things in there which are inaccurate, which are false. Now I've got a problem because I as a Shi'i may have been relying my whole life on Kitab Sulaim about the incident of Fatima Zahra salam. There are ulama who sit on Mambar who will quote verbatim from Kitab Sulaim without acknowledging maybe what Ayatollah al has said, what Al-Bahbudi has said, what for example Sheikh Al-Mufid has said. But do we have Kitab Sulaim? Yes we do. One may argue, of course, that Kitab Sulaim, it may not be Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali's work, or it may not even be Aban bin Abi Ayash, or it may not even be Umar bin Udayna, but it certainly reflects a particular opinion that existed early. The details, like any Shi'i work, are open to scrutiny. It's not Sahih Kitab Sulaim, nor is it that. But the reality is, the first book I'll go to, there's a question mark there. So what do I do as a Shi'i? But that's the first book I'll go to, Kitab Sulaim bin Qais al-Hilali, because I'm taught that Kitab Sulaim, Sulaim is a companion of Imam Ali, Imam al-Hassan, Imam al-Hussein, Imam al-Baqir, uh, Imam Zayn al-Abidin, Imam al-Baqir. So when I see that, I'm like, wow, this man's amazing. But then I see that scholars look at that work and they say that be careful and that those scholars are not just now. Those scholars are scholars who have existed for a certain 
period of time. So now the first book of Shia will go to is Kitab Sulaim. Kitab Sulaim discusses what's taken place, but there's a question mark there. Second book that I as a Shia will go to after Kitab Sulaim is which one? Where will I go after Kitab Sulaim? Because if I find that Kitab Sulaim is problematic, then where do I go? What do I do? I've got mosques organizing program. I've got youth beating themselves till they faint. I've got people screaming loudly, Ya Fatima, La Baik, Ya Fatima. Okay, but bro, where is this written? The thing that you're crying about? I'm, I'm not understanding. This is something you inherited from your parents and you just believe in it? Or where, where, where? How do you justify it? I'm looking now after that Kitab Sulaim. I might go towards, for example, Basa'ir al-Darajat, okay, of a Safar. Again, a text that is relatively early, but it's a Shi'i text, but that I will use, I will look in there. I will then go to where? Al-Kafi of Shaykh Al-Kulayni. And I will look in there and I will hope that I find something. Isn't that true? I hope that within Al-Kafi of Shaykh Al-Kulayni, because we see that Al-Kafi is seen as the number one book in Shi'ism, so I hope that I find something in there which I can use to bring all the qara'in, all the contextual proofs, whatever, together so that I'm able to build the case. Then after that, where will I go? Which other books of Shi'i literature? What saddens me about the Shi'i world is that if you haven't been to Hawza or you've not studied Islam, why is it that in your spare time you cannot read some literature yourself about the development of your own literature? Why? Why are there so many who don't know about development? If I mention Kitab Sulaim, what's Kitab Sulaim? Basar al darajat what's Basar al darajat Al-Kafi, only recently it's been, for example, completely translated and discussed. Where else will I go after that? I'll go to Sheikh Al-Mufid. Sheikh Al-Mufid, I will look within his works. I will see, has Sheikh Al-Mufid discussed what happened with Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? Because of the works that is attributed to Sheikh Al-Mufid. And there's a question mark about the attribution. But it's a work that's definitely earlier. And maybe earlier than Mufid is Kitab Al-Ikhtisas. Al-Ikhtisas is one of the main Shi'i references for the incident of the door. But how many of us have opened Kitab Al-Ikhtisas? How many of us have even discussed Al-Ikhtisas? But Kitab al-Ikhtisas, there is an opinion that's attributed to Shaykh al-Mufid. There are another two who it's attributed to. What we do not doubt is that within there is the highest level of scholarship when looking at Islamic history and the Islamic belief system. And that within there, there is a discussion. A discussion of what? Remember, we're trying to bring the sources together to try and see exactly what took place. Shaykh al-Mufid, who else will I go to? I have to go, of course, to Shaykh al-Saduq. Because Mufid and Saduq are the pillars of my aqaid when it comes to whether the book Al-Atiqadat or Tasheeh Al-Atiqadat al or for example Al-Imamiyya, I have to make sure that I go to Mufid and I go to Saduq. Shaykh Al-Saduq has so many works. And within these works, you get an understanding of Fatima Al-Zahra salam and what she went through. I'll open Shaykh Al-Saduq and I'll go to the Amali of Shaykh Al-Saduq. His lectures, for example, where notes were taken. I'll go to, for example, Kamil Ziyarat. And within there, I'm going to have an examination. I'm going to see what's written. Did Sheikh al-Saduq believe in the incident of the door? Did Sheikh al-Mufid believe? Then I'll go to who? I have to, of course, go to Sheikh al-Ta'if, Sheikh al-Tusi. Sheikh al-Tusi, I will go to him. I want to see the Shafi. I want to see, for example, Sharif al-Murtada. And I want to see the Talqiyas and so on. So I want to bring these works together of Tusi and Murtada. And I want to see, is the incident mentioned there? I want to also examine, has Sheikh Tusi discussed what the Shia believe? Maybe has Sheikh Al-Mufid discussed Muhsin in Kitab Al-Arshad? What have they said about these things? Have they categorically said, this is very important, have they categorically said, that Umar is the one who slapped Fatima or kicked Fatima to Zahra salam or beat Fatima? If they haven't, then why am I saying it? Or have they mentioned Qunfud? And who is the first to mention Qunfud? Is it that I then go into the next series of Shi'i works? But some of these Shi'i works are questionable as to authorship. Dala'il al-Imama, Ithbat al wasiya works like this you always see are referenced when it comes to the incident of the door. 
But even there's maybe a question mark. Which Tabari is this referring to? Which Mas'udi is this referring to? Is it their works? Is it Ibn Qutayba? Can I rely on these? But again, these are Shi'i works which have been written, which reflect that part of the Shi'i community in that early period had an understanding regarding the incident of the door. Look in London today, for example. There is an understanding of the incident of the door. Some people believe that, look, I believe that she was oppressed but not killed. I believe she was killed but her rib wasn't broke. I believe that she was killed but they didn't trample on her. I believe that she was killed but I don't believe she got slapped. Likewise, in the Shi'i community, what I need to do is I need to get all these sources together. Beginning with Kitab Sulaim, and when I get Kitab Sulaim, I cannot just because something suits me in the book, say, look here. I have to ask myself, is the veracity of Kitab Sulaim really at that level? I have to then look at these other works. Someone says, but Sayyidina, why don't you mention, for example, Bihar? I don't want to go all the way to Bihar, written a couple of hundred years ago. I want to stick to the earliest literature, in order for me to ascertain this incident of the door that I've been taught from a young age, which looks black and white, there's no doubts about what took place. No, on the contrary. Tomorrow, when I bring all of these together, we see how we can bring it. How about non-Shia? Non-Shia. Where do they go to understand? Because there may be some non-Shia watching this. And when they're watching it, they're like, hold on a minute, I want to ask you a question. I, as a non-Shia, in my books, is there any possibility of the incident of Umar Abu Bakr versus Fatima Ali and a Zubair and a fight occurring in the house of Fatima or outside the house or inside the house would I find it in the works of non-Shia can I find it in Sunni works so which Sunni works would we begin with we'd begin by looking at one of the earliest works for example by the Kufan scholar Ibn Abi Shayba who has the work the Musannaf I have to go towards the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba. I have to open it up. Now, there may be some Sunnis who are listening to me who might turn around and say that I have never heard of this work. But don't worry. Firstly, the Shia, I haven't heard of many of their works. You've not done much wrong in your life. But secondly, there may be some who might turn around to me and say, oh, well, Ibn Abi Shayba is pro-Shia. I'm not interested in the inclination of Mufid, Saduq, Tusi, because I know they have their own theological differences. I want to show that in early Islam, the incident of the door was not some random thing. That it was there because Ibn Abi Shayba is when? Ibn Abi Shayba lived at the time of Imam al kadhim Imam al kadhim alayhi salam lived just over a hundred years since the incident of the door. So therefore, the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, some might say, well, he's pro Shia. Baba, I'm not interested. Just because he has a problem with Muawiyah doesn't make him Shi'i. There were many who had problems with Muawiyah for many years until a rehabilitation process took place recently. Now, so you have Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba. I'm going to start there. Is it okay that we start there? Yes, early. I am then also going to use Sahih al-Bukhari. Sahih al-Bukhari is written around the time of Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam and Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. So therefore, I'm going to go to Sahih al-Bukhari. Maybe in Sahih al-Bukhari, I'll find that there's a war of words happening. Because if I find in Sahih al-Bukhari that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam dies angry with Abu Bakr or Umar, I have to begin to reassess my own path. I'm going to use Sahih al-Bukhari. I'm going to use the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba. Then I'm going to use a number of works some people have heard of, some haven't. The likes of the Ansab al-Ashraf of al-Baladhari. I'm going to use the Tariq of Tabari. I'm going to bring, for example, some scholars. Are they Shi'i? Are they not Shi'i? But they have works of history like Yaqubi. Ibn Sa'ad. Fundamental. I want to see what Ibn Sa'ad thinks. I want to also bring Qadi Abdul Jabbar. Let's see what he says. Renowned scholar. Let's hear what he's got to say. When I bring Tabari and Baladhari and Ibn Sa'ad and Ibn Hajar and Ibn Taymiyyah, someone says yes, but some of these doubt the incident. Some of these say the incident's forgery. Yes, some of them also believe that part of the incident is true. Part is a forgery. I don't mind that. All I want to show is that I as a Shi'i, when I believe that Fatima al-Zahra, Madluma, Mustahida, Maqhura, Shahida, it has something there. There might be certain scholars people have not heard of. 
Uyayni, for example. Maybe someone's not heard of. Maybe someone hasn't heard of Tabarani, but we'll still bring them in. We'll bring in others and try and understand what they have had to say on this particular area. So if I'm Sunni and I want to know about whether there's any reality to the incident of the door, I can use the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba. I can also go to uh, something like the Maghazi of Musa bin Uqba. I can go towards there and I can look within the Maghazi. I can look at the likes of Abdul Rahman bin Auf's sons like Ibrahim or for example Abu Salam and see their discussions on the incident of the door. When I therefore look in Shi'i and non-Shi'i literature, I find that whether I come to a conclusion on the scrupulous details of the incident on the door, one thing is clear. There's a collective memory in the Muslim community that definitely believed there was a problem. There's definitely a problem. Because you cannot have someone write an apo- There are some people who will work their socks off apologetically to try and find an excuse for what happened. That highlights that this was a problem. When a person works his socks off, which I'll show you inshallah in the coming nights, how some people work their socks off to protect Omar's statement of burning the door. Just listen to some of the arguments I'm going to show you of how people are willing to sacrifice everything just to say that, you know, when Omar threatened to burn the house, you've got to understand it's for the sake of the religion. I'm going to show you how people do it. But my issue on those areas will come in the forthcoming nights. My main problem here is a question. Someone will say to me, use Shia, use Sunni. If you use Shia or Sunni, one thing you'll never find, a Sahih, perfect chain, which shows what you Shia believe in. They're probably right. Can I find you a Sahih, perfect chain about what the Shia believe in in terms of Omar? and the door of Fatima, or Qunfud, and the door of Fatima. Can I find you something sahih and perfect? The problem is in the question. Since when were the standards of fiqh to be applied to history? If we're going to apply the scrupulous standards of fiqh, someone says, what do you mean? When I am using sahih and da'if and muwathaq, and for example, Hassan and Mutawatir and Mu'an'an and Musnad and Mursal and all. When I'm using all of these, for example, I may use them in the world of jurisprudence because I need to know, is this hadith giving me a command from Allah or a prohibition? I need to know because I have to act on this. So therefore, scrupulously, when it comes to the world of fiqh, the traditions I have to look at have to be authentic. I've got to verify the narrators. Because someone could easily do something here. They can use Ayatollah al-Khu'i's opinion on the narrators of hadith and apply them on a historical issue when Ayatollah al-Khu'i was using that application for a fiqh issue. Say Ayatollah al-Khu'i has discussed, for example, a number of narrators as he does in his voluminous work on the Mu'jam. Ayatollah al-Khu'i is giving us an understanding of whether these narrators are reliable or not, but looking at the works of jurisprudence and the world of hadith. Someone can easily come and say, but Ayatollah al-Khu'i doesn't believe in the incident on the door. You say, when does Ayatollah al-Khu'i not believe in the incident on the door? You say, because Ayatollah al-Khu'i, if you use his standards, no, no, you said to me, Ayatollah al-Khu'i doesn't believe in the incident of the door. You're saying that to me, explain to me. Say, no, 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 no. If you use the mabani of Ayatollah al-Khu'i, mabani for what? Jurisprudential issue or historical issue? In a jurisprudential issue, of course, I'm going to have to find that which is, even though the ulama have discussed for centuries, that khabar which is ahad versus a khabar which is mutawatir. Can I take from this narrator? Can I take from that narrator? Ulama even have their own differences of opinion. But when it comes to an issue that's jurisprudential, one thing Muslim ulama believe in, that there is more of discussion, of a scrupulous nature when it comes to a fiqhi narration rather than comes to history. Why? Because if I'm going to apply sahih onto history, wallah, even the seerah of my prophet becomes questionable. Even the seerah of my prophet, if it's not for the Quran, let's go to the world of hadith. Half of these narrators, I can turn around and say, well, this one's da'if, this one's majhul, this one I don't trust, this one could have been made. I can, But in the world of history, when it comes to seerah, the reality is that those standards are not to be applied. Recently, of course, they are to be applied when a particular school needs to defend its position. That when a person sees a hadith in their books which puts Abu Bakr or Umar under major scrutiny, they're like, but that narrator is majhul. 
That narrator died. That narrator, okay, you may have a point. But since when are we applying that scrupulous nature in the world of hadith, which we normally apply in the world of fiqh? And I'll give you an example of one particular hadith to round off tonight's discussion. There is a hadith, and it's narrated by renowned scholars. And it's one that causes the non-Shi'i a problem when it comes to the incident of the door. That the non-Shi'i has to take all the principles of jurisprudence and apply them to history and say, well, this narrator's weak, this narrator's weak. Why? Because it puts Abu Bakr in a difficult position. Because if Tabari and Tabarani and others narrate that Abu Bakr talks about his regrets at the end of his life, in this world, all of us at one stage, when we go towards our deathbed, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the good health, what may come across our minds? Certain things we regret in our life. Do you agree? The reality is that Abu Bakr regretting certain things, we are not masoom sitting here that we're not going to regret certain things. At the end of the day, every human being comes to their deathbed and there may be certain things that sadden them or upset them or they regret and you say, Ya laytani qaddamtu li hayati. I wish I had given more towards my life. Or you may turn around and say that I reflect on this moment and I could have done things a bit different. The hadith discusses Abu Bakr, the first Khalifa, and his regrets. He says, there are certain things which I did, which I wish I never. And there are certain things I never did, which I wish I did. And there are three questions. And he mentions three on each, by the way. There are three things which I did did which I wish I never. And there are three things which I didn't do, which I wish I did. And there are three things which I wish I asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now this hadith, I as a Shi'i, I'm not saying I have to take it, but look at how it reflects that in the Muslim community, there was definitely a question mark about Abu Bakr and Umar and Fatima through this one hadith. What is it? Abu Bakr says there were three things which I, he says nothing saddened me except three things which I wish I didn't do but I did. The first of them, let's look at the three. I'll give them in my own order for the sake of the lecture. The first of them is that I killed Fuja'a sulami Yes? And Fuja'a sulami was one of the apostates in the Ridda Wars. He says that my regret was that I burnt him. That person, you know this Ridda Wars, after the Prophet died, they said people had left Islam, Murtad, and they went and killed people, and these people, some of them were claiming they were prophets, but Malik bin Nuwayra believed in Ali ibn Abi Talib, therefore he had to be killed as well. But anyway, you found that he says, I wish that I didn't burn but rather that I had either killed him or that I had kept, released. First thing, three things which I regret that I did them and I wish I hadn't. Second of them is that becoming Khalifa. I wish I had given it to Omar or Abu Ubaidah who the Prophet can't give it and you're now giving it. Wallah, I don't understand. The man who came with the religion cannot give the leadership. But Abu Bakr and Umar, wallah, I don't understand. Besides, why do we have to smile? You found that, he says, that the second thing which I regret, which I did and I wish I hadn't, was what? Was that I took the caliphate. Instead, I should have given it to Umar or Abu Ubaidah. And this is not Shia, this is non-Shia. I'm showing you how it exists. And that I became a minister for them. Second. Third. What is it Abu Bakr? The third thing. That you wish you hadn't done. But you did. He said invade the house of Fatima. <clears throat> now. I may have somebody out there listening saying. Wallah this narrator is bad. But, but you can defend all you want. It doesn't matter. For me. All it reflects is that there was a belief that existed there. Call it forgery, call it myth, call it what you want. We'll look at Bukhari tomorrow where he makes it clear who's angry with who. <coughs> but suffice, there are three things. The first, with who? Fuja as -Sulami. The second is what? Taking the caliphate. The third, I wish I didn't invade or I hadn't invaded the house of Fatima. 
the door of Fatima, the house of Fatima, even if what was in there was ready for war. <clears throat> because the whole idea was, you guys probably have weapons in there, so there shouldn't be an issue entering. Yeah, you have to give bay'ah to the leader of your time, who were the prophet people who didn't give bay'ah to him, didn't go around killing them. But you have to go around to people's houses and put them under threat if they don't give bay'ah to you. Anyway, so he says, then he says there are three things which I didn't do, but I wish I had done. What are those three? We mentioned them quickly. Of them, something which I didn't do, but I wish I'd done, I wish I had killed Al-Ash'af bin Qais. <clears throat> Al-Ash'af bin Qais, his daughter killed Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam. Ja'da, the daughter of Al-Ash'af. He said, I wish I had killed him when I had him as captive and struck his neck because I knew the trouble this man would cause the religion. Second, when I sent Khalid ibn al-Walid towards the expedition, I wish I had parked myself by there just in case they were defeated and I could have helped them. And the third is when I put Khalid ibn al-Walid and I made him go to Sham, I should have made Umar ibn al-Khattab go to Iraq. Okay? So those are the three things which I didn't do <clears throat> when I should have. And then he says there are three things which I wish I had asked the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. First one, who's the leader after you? <clears throat> the second one, what the opinion was on the Ansar. The third one, can the brother's daughter, in, can the daughter of the brother inherit? And can the father's sister inherit? For these I do not know about. And that's why in Shia thought we believe, <coughs> if you're going to be Khalif of the Muslims, then your knowledge on these things should be perfect. You know, can my brother's daughter inherit if I'm the leader of the Muslims? If I'm just a mujtahid, a marja, a maulana, a sheikh, I should know these things. Can my father's sister inherit my auntie, for example? What can These are things I should know if I'm a normal maulana who has studied fiqh to a certain level, let alone khalifatil <coughs> muslimin. Therefore, this tradition, what does it show me? Abu Bakr admitting in Sunni literature, Someone might turn around, but even you have things in your own Shia literature you don't believe in. Whether I believe or I don't believe, there is still a discussion here of a regret. There is something that exists that highlights that the Shia opinion about an invasion on the door is not something which is far-fetched. But rather within the literature of the early period, it's there. Was that the only regret that someone like him had? No doubt, that's not the only ones. Because part of it was the fact that he invaded the house. But also part of it was a reflection on the other traditions where the Prophet had reminded everybody of how to behave with the people of that house. Did not the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, say that I leave behind for you two weighty things. Hold on to them and you will not go astray. The Quran, and I ask you to look after my family. Let's say in that narration, I ask you to look after my family did the Muslim community look after the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi after he had died? I ask all of you, all of you who are watching at home, that after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi died, did the Muslim community look after his family? Did they protect them? Did they honor them? Shortly after he died, his daughter Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam joined her father. Years after that, who joined? His son-in-law, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. A few years after that, who joined? In Jannat al-Baqiyah tonight, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. But no doubt, the most horrendous of all of them, when it came to treatment, the man of the last of those five, the last of Ahlul Bayt, the last of the ones who the Prophet said, look after them, the man who was there alone on the plains of Karbala. But even that man, in his final moments, his mother Zahra was there with him. In which way? That even in his final moments, as he was coming out of the battlefield, he heard a voice, Mahlan, Mahlan, Ibn Zahra, wait there, 
wait there, O son of Zahra. It was his sister Zainab calling out to him. Uh, many people forget that Sayyida Zainab alayha salam on nights like this, uh, she also suffered from seeing what her mother went through. Uh, she called out, Mahlan, Mahlan, Ibn Zahra. Uh, wait, wait, O son of Zahra, come back to me. Uh, uh, when she called out Yabna Zahra, she knew his mother was a soft spot for him. She knew that if he heard the voice of his mother, it would get him to come back. He came back towards his sister Zainab. She turned around and she looked towards the land of Medina. Why would she turn around and look towards the land of Medina? Of all places, you're in Karbala. Why would you turn to Medina? Because she wanted it to fulfill the aman of her mother Fatima when she was with Abba Abdullah. What did she do? She looked towards the neck of Imam Al Hussein and she looked towards the chest of Imam Al Hussein. She kissed the neck of the Imam and she kissed the chest of Abba Abdullah. Why? Why are you kissing the neck? Why are you kissing the chest? As for the neck, she knew there'd be a moment when a shimmer would take the neck of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Then why would you kiss the chest? We can understand the neck. We can understand him taking the neck. But how about the chest? Because she knew that the chest that Fatima used to kiss would be the chest which the horses of Umayya would trample on. And that's why you found later on that many of the poets of Al Muhammad they knew that if you wanted Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam from the world where she is in, you wanted her soft spot, then all you had to do was remind her of the tragedy of her son. You found many of the Imams when they would sit, they'd sit with their poets and they'd say to them at that moment, recite for me poetry. Imam al Rada alayhi salam would sit with Da'bal bin Ali al Khuza'i. Da'bal could recite any line for Imam al Rada alayhi salam. There are so many lines to recite but one would stick with him Afatimu law khilt al-Husayn mujaddalan wa qad ma ta'at shanan bishat fura إذا لطمت الخد فاطم عنده وأجريت دمع العين في الوجنات أفاطم قوم يا ابنة الخير واندبي Let's raise our hands, my dear brothers and sisters. All of us raise our hands in dua. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Ya Allah, raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman. Give us the intercession of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Ya Allah, allow us one day to see the holy grave of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. There are many who are feeling unwell in times like this. There are many who are going through hardships and difficulties. Let's all raise our hands wherever you may be and recite the verse of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-muftar idha da'a wa yakshib al-su. All together. Amman yujibu al-muftar idha da'a ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء يا الله we ask you to look after all of our brethren around the Muslim world especially our brothers brothers and sisters in the land of Yemen, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we pray for all the oppressed ones. We pray for all those who are deceased, who instilled in us the love of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Surah Al-Fatiha. But before that, welcome our dear Mullah Rashid with the loudest of your salawat. <laughs>
IHDRF is proud to announce the launch of its app, Sedica. Sedica is a modern, easy, and interactive way for you to pay your charity. Your Sedica can be transferred instantly and directly start helping orphans. Furthermore, you can donate to different projects such as clothing orphans, supplying clean water, heating fuel for the winter, and feeding the hungry. When you pay your Sedica, it will be used to feed, clothe, and school orphans. Our app is accessible via the App Store and Google Play Store. Download today and pay your Sedica. duty towards the preservation and the propagation of the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Indeed, one of the best ways to work towards the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi ajalallah ta'ala farajul sharif is through promoting the values of Karbala. Imam Hussein Media Group is the only Shia television network that broadcasts globally in five different languages, Arabic, Farsi, Turkish, Urdu, and English. We are appealing to the lovers of Imam Hussein alayhi salam worldwide to support the channel such that it may continue its global operations. Imam Hussein Media Group is seeking 1,000 partners to pledge to a 14 pound contribution per month. This will allow the channel to sustain its operating costs as we continue to spread the message of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in multiple languages across the globe. You be a part of this great legacy and donate today. You can pledge in two ways. www.imamhussein3.tv slash donate will take you direct to our donation page where you can pledge monthly. Or you can call or WhatsApp us on 0044-793-991763. Imam Hussein TV, your gateway to Karbala. Bye.